Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the sixth uh, OneHub Insider Communication session. Uh, I'm Jonathan Lamb. I look after the OneHub business uh, within the Standard Bank Group. And and really, you know, the 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 purpose of these sessions is is uh, to inform, to inspire you, and really to give you uh, some insight into where we're going and what we're doing. Um, in our business and how we're thinking about things. We really try and bring in thought leaders and, and we definitely have uh, managed to accomplish that today. Um, you know, our, our drive has been to complement our traditional financial products with a suite of non-traditional products. And as we've gone down this path, you know, the journey we've been on for the last two years, obviously, and not too surprisingly, data has uh, reared its head as a great opportunity uh, a bit of a, a, a bewildering opportunity, if you want. Um, and so the last two series have followed the data theme. We've had a look at our smart nudge solution and what we're thinking about there. We've discussed uh, the ethics of AI. And today we're continuing with that theme. Um, so we're going to continue with uh, the conversation around what, what, what the possibility looks like, where the opportunity sits, and in fact, today, we're going to try and predict the future and see how CEOs uh, are using data to stay ahead. So without uh, any more intro, I'm going to hand over to Colin, who will introduce our guest and, and take us forward. Col, over to you. Thank you very much, Jono, and uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. Thanks for joining us. It's great to see a load of names that have been on calls before and uh, people that are in the network who've been following these recent calls. So thank you very much for joining. Um, as always, I think it must be getting boring if you've been on these calls before. I really do encourage you to go and put your own questions out there. If you really want me to pick it up, stick it in the Q&A, um, but by all means, put the comments down as well. Last session, when we were looking at the ethics of AI and then talking about data science in institutions, where some awesome flows of comments going, actually, there was a whole separate conversation that was working, which I thought was fantastic. This one, however, we're moving up a gear. We're starting to look in the futuristic perspective, an area which I love talking about. And I'm going to frame it around how the top CEOs are using data to stay ahead. And it's with that that it's really, really exciting that we've managed to convince Bill Schmarzo to join us. He's sitting actually in the center of where data and analytics is happening in big corporates, in startups, in the fintechs, in everything that's exploding in San Fran and California. So I'm as looking forward to this one as much as you guys. Bill, a very warm welcome. Thanks, Colin. Glad to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Now, after that intro, I think it's better if you intro yourself because I've looked through your CV and if I go and, and repeat that, we're going to be here for about 45 minutes. What, what are the key points there? I think the, the key point for me is, is that first and foremost, I'm a teacher um, in the sense that I'm always seeking to learn. And as a teacher, um, I find that the, the burden on me is to sometimes take very complex topics and explain it in a way so that's understandable and actionable. And I, I do teach at several universities. Um, I've written several books um, that all, most of them are really pragmatic sort of, you know, how-to books. And I also work at Dell Technology. So I'm a fairly, fairly busy person. All right. So let, let's kick off then. And from your, I mean, we're going to just build off your experiences actually. And for everyone on the call, I've looked through, I think, two of the books now. They're absolutely fantastic. But I want to kick off with this idea about the power that data can bring into organizations. I've got a, a theory, I suppose, or a thought from my own experiences. Maybe I've just dealt with the wrong organizations that most organizations are pretty backwards when it comes to data. But there are huge opportunities in most um, organizations that even the ones that, you know, sitting there with all their legacies and their hierarchies, and technical debt and everything else. What power do you think data can actually bring to organizations? Well, I think you're spot on, Colin, and most organizations haven't figured out how to get their value from data. And I think that part of that challenge comes from the fact that we tend to think about data as a technology byproduct and not a economic asset. And so um, I think the challenge organizations have of all sizes, by the way, is first understanding how the organization creates value and then going through a process to figure out where, what data and analytics do I need to sort of uncover those sources of value. So the, 
and many organizations, I think, just they, they want to dive into the shiny new object. I think that's a challenge of our, our industry. We're seeing this now with, with generative AI, right? The, the fact that we can do all this really cool stuff is we just get so consumed by the shiny object that sometimes we lose the, the practical nature of saying, okay, what is it as an organization we are trying to accomplish? What are our key initiatives? How do we measure success? Who are our stakeholders? And what are their desired outcomes? And what are the KPIs and metrics against which they can measure success? Starting there, then I can start figuring out, well, how does Gen AI, how does deep learning, how does you know blockchain, how do all these technologies help us to achieve that? But we we sort of get confused by an ends and the means. And you know, having data isn't the end, it's just a means to a more powerful end. Mm. I think you've mentioned before that um you see data as it, historically at least being usually assessed as being some bookkeeping entry, which doesn't even sit on your balance sheet in a positive way. It doesn't go on the balance sheet at all. It's just expense the whole time. And one key thing that you advise CEOs to do is actually to stop looking at it as an expense, but look at it as an asset. Can you explain in a bit more detail what you mean by that? Yeah, good question. So little, little backwards, we're going to go back to Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith, 1776, where he talks about the difference between an accounting asset valuation method and economics as an asset valuation method. In accounting, the value of an asset is determined by what someone's willing to pay for that asset. So for example, if you had me and an Uber driver standing right here, and we both go out and buy a $40,000 car, the accounting value of that car is exactly the same for me as it is the Uber driver. That's just how accounting works. Economics, though, is a different valuation process. The the economic value is the value is determined by that the value of that asset in use. That is what how you use that asset to create new sources of value. So going back to our Uber driver, I got a forty thousand dollar car, sits in my driveway, collects dust, drives to the store every now and then, certainly is not worth forty thousand dollars. Uber driver, on the other hand, has a forty thousand dollar car, uses that to, to drive people around, to deliver goods. And when they're not using the car, they're leasing it out to other people. The economic value of that car is dramatically more valuable to the Uber driver. Why? Because the, from an economics perspective, it's a value in use. And so when we start thinking about data as an economic asset, it's not the possession of data that has value. In fact, possession of data is a cost, as you mentioned. It's a, you got to store it, you got to back it up, you got to protect it. It's only receives value. Your data only generates value when you start to use it to create new sources of value. Mm. Have you got any good use cases on that where companies are actually taking hold of data and turning it and exploding it into something that's got obvious value? Yeah, I mean, you, I almost can, you almost can pick almost any industry. Just talk about healthcare for a second. How hospitals are using the data they have about all their patients to identify patients who are likely to catch a staph infection or a hospital acquired infection in the hospital, or they're using that to um, reduce unplanned readmissions. Um, you can, you see it used in, in manufacturing around predictive maintenance and reducing unplanned downtime and optimizing inventory. You see it in, you know, consumer goods areas where customer acquisition, customer retention, customer cross sales. It's, it's, it's the number of use cases is almost boundless. And that is part of the problem, mm. is that organizations don't suffer from lack of use cases, they suffer from, they suffer from you know having too many, and so what they need to make sure if they're going to apply data as an economic asset to these different use cases, customer acquisition, unplanned downtime, improved customer care, right, whatever it might be, be, they need to have a process to identify, validate, value, and prioritize those use cases across your different stakeholders. This is tricky. This is why the cultural transformation conversation I know we're going to get into is really yeah. critical. It isn't just data scientists on their own who are creating models and throwing them at business users and say, here you go, make better decisions. That never works. And it's not because the technology doesn't work. It's because number one, you may not have defined the problem accurately, the problem we're trying to solve. But more importantly, problem number two is if the business stakeholders the subject matter experts are not involved in that process. They'll have zero confidence in what's being delivered to them, and they won't use it. I think that's a really interesting. Um, I love that. We're going to use that one again when I do a next uh, 
post somewhere. Businesses don't fail for lack of user cases. They fail because they've got too many user cases. Um, yeah. How do you guys actually go and start resolving that though? Because I guess when, when you talk about operating models and structures, you know, typically I see data scientists, let's go back a step actually, I see the technology team being given the data scientists. They're sitting there uh, being asked to on top of their existing duties of maintaining and storing data, ensuring financial reporting in a typical organization, implementing CRM platforms, making sure that we've got ERPs in place, you know, core things which are important for most organizations. And suddenly, here you go, go and get into this data science thing, start using analytics to go and do crazy things, which previously perhaps was sitting more in the business. The business were responsible for understanding these data sets and making decisions around pricing. Has there been some sort of shift that uh, we need to see in organizations about these org structures to better access and use data and take decisions about how to access and use data? Well, there's about about five questions in there. So there was a, that was a, that was a, <laughs> that was just, let's start with the data science organization. No, let's start with the use case one and make sure to come back to the data science one. Because I think the, the use case, the challenge of use cases will help us to understand how to optimize our organizational structure. So the, the process that we go through that I work through with my customers is, is to do, I call one of these envisioning workshops. And the I have a methodology called the art of thinking like a data scientist. I've got a book I wrote about it. I, I blog about it frequently. My university classes are all designed around that methodology. And that's a methodology for understanding what is the organization trying to accomplish? Who are all my key stakeholders? What are their desired outcomes? What are their key decisions? What are the KPIs and metrics against which they're gonna measure effectiveness? And how do you bring all that together to identify validate value and prioritize use cases. So I, I'll come up with, my problem is how do I improve customer retention? There's a bunch of use cases that are gonna fall out of that. Customer lifetime value calculation, cross sell, et cetera, all these kind of things. I wanna bring the stakeholders together into a room once you've identified all the use cases that support that business initiative and go through a process to align them on a chart that says value versus implementation feasibility. And I wanna find those use cases that are, have high value and a high feasibility of success. So I want to cheat. That's one of the reasons why I think the methodology works so well. That's the reason why I have a lot of success is I cheat. I pick those use cases that have high value, that have a high feasibility of success that's been agreed upon by across the organization. So we're all aligned along that. Now, the reason why the use case approach is really critical, Colin, is because we can use a use case by use case incremental approach to not only attack use cases where each use case pays for itself as a positive ROI, but maybe more importantly from a technology perspective, I can use a use case by use case approach to build out my data and analytics capabilities. For example, I don't need to build a data lake and throw 35 data sets in it before I can do anything. Heck, the 35 data sets may be the wrong data sets. My first use case may only require three data sets. So let's use that use case and those three data sets it needs, we're gonna put that into our data lake, data lake house where we have. And I'm gonna build the only the analytics I need to support that. So I can take this sort of incremental approach to building out not only my architecture, my technology, data and analytics architecture, but use case by use case, delivering value and bringing in the business stakeholders who are seeing that. The other subtle benefit to this is that it allows me to exploit the economies of learning. What I mean by that is, Anything I learned from the implementation of the first use case, I get to reuse in the second and third use case. And this is really important when I think about data and, and analytics as economic assets. Now, the data economic multiplier effect says, once I have that data set put into my data repository, governance, metadata management, quality, et cetera, I get to use that data set across an unlimited number of use cases at zero marginal cost. This is this this ability to reuse and any modifications and learnings I get improving that data set ripple through all the other use cases to use that data set. This is what makes this economics conversation around data and analytics so powerful. It's an economic asset we've never seen before. It behaves differently than we've ever seen before, and it prospers from the incremental approach versus the you know, traditional ERP big bang approach where we're gonna define all the requirements up front, spend four to five years building it and hope at the end of those four or five years, something of value squirts out at the end. 
So you've just mentioned something which is is critical for some of the biggest and fastest growing businesses in the world. Their business models are totally dependent on the marginal cost of each of servicing every additional customer actually falling away to zero. And one reason that they can do that is, as you've just said, if you can better use your data, you get that flywheel effect. The marginal cost for every user case after you've got that initial setup in place is basically zero, maybe some storage and calc costs. But most organizations fail to get to that point for a couple of reasons. First is, I mean, you've mentioned data lakes. A lot of uh, companies will put up SQL databases and, you know, we'll go into that or I'll ask you to go into that in a minute. And then secondly, they don't share the data. No one has access to the data. No one is aware of what's going on actually with those data sets. So they can't copy and enhance and move it forward. Could you just talk about those those two uh, components, the, the data lake versus other storage mechanisms, and then how to make sure your organization knows what's happening so that they can flywheel it? Yeah, the, the, the data lake approach was this idea that we could just load all of our data into a central repository and everybody have access to it. And it introduced, it introduced lag into the decision-making process. So any sort of real-time use cases you had, had a way for the data to land in this data lake before I could analyze it. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a Starbucks and you're trying to optimize my marketing to me as an individual, knowing that I was at that Starbucks store at the corner of Stanford and El Camino two days ago doesn't do you any good, right? So the, the data lake had a latency effect. It also seduced us into thinking by just making all the data centralized, located, people would be able to find it. And we didn't do enough to make sure to, you know, advertise and promote what data we have. And so there's, there is a lot of architectural movements today. There's a, much, a lot of smarter, more smart people than this than me. But the idea of leaving data in place and virtually accessing where it is, not only makes it reduce, it, will, it drives down my overall cost, but more importantly, it enables all those real-time use cases. I don't have to wait for data to move around. And in fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push the analytics to where the data is. Instead of bringing the data back to where the analytics is, let's let's sort of embrace, I'm gonna call it a, a hub and spoke model, where I've got mm -hmm. you know the, the analytics happening out at the edges of the organization, the edges of customer engagement and operational execution. So I think from a technology perspective, we're seeing this idea that instead of bringing everything to one location, let's push the analytics to where they are. And, and enable all those real-time use cases that historically we've not been able to take advantage of. I love, the sound, of, yeah, so I love the sound of that. So leave the data where it is in its natural, obvious locations, rather than trying to centralize it and map it and, and think about all possible scenarios and just slow down uh, <laughs> so that you go from real-time data to perhaps accurate but old stale data, which is pretty useless. <laughs> what are you doing? Then in the end user side of things, in terms of accessing that data, is it a central team that kind of supports every single business unit? I mean, using that example of Starbucks, it's a bit extreme. Would we imagine inverted commas having mini data analysts in every Starbucks store? What's, uh, how, do, how do you go and, and, and grapple with this? Because my sense is it's getting easier. And I just want to perhaps finish it with a with a um, one thought process is it's getting easier to analyze data because of the tools that are coming. So obviously chat GPT has arrived. I can ask some questions in two years time. I think I'm going to be able to use that to generate quite good quality data. And I think anyone in an organization is going to be able to uh, be some sort of data analyst to a degree. So is there the argument that we should be pushing out the analytics and use of data to as many people or just keep it centralized with the skilled experts who've got the uh, computer and machine learning expertise? So we, we certainly want to push the analytic insights out to the front lines where people can act on them. I don't want my um, barista to have to become a data scientist. I don't want to have, have my, my mechanical engineer to have to become a data scientist, but I can certainly deliver predictive insights to those people. I can, I can send a notice to the, the operator of a um, theme park, for example, that a particular component is likely to break within the next two hours, and we should probably act on it, right? They don't have to code that, but they should be the recipient of, I'm gonna call them prescriptive analytics that tell them there's a problem that's gonna occur, and these are the kind of actions you can take to do that. For, again, going back to this, this part's going to break. That's great. So I need to have the system tell me who's most likely to fix that part, how much inventory I need, 
What are the consumables? What are my education? When can I actually bring something down so I can do that and bring it back up? You know, how do I, all the dissociated decisions that go with that action are what we can deliver to the front lines. We can turn them into, a lack of a better term, citizens of data science. So they're the consumers of that versus having to actually become citizen data scientists. So to me, that's the real power, is we deliver the analytic insights to the front line so they can make, you know, have better customer engagement and better operational execution. You also lead into a really good question too, which is how do we design our data science team? And I think that for a lot of companies just starting, centralizing everything makes a lot of sense, your data science team, because they all can talk to each other. You wanna keep that sort of community growing. But as you mature, what I see as a best practice is this hub and spoke model, where you have a hub of data scientists whose job is to turn analytics into AI products. So they're, they're not only data scientists, but they're almost app developers. And they have some UI people with them, with them as well, right? And some data engineers. Their, their job is to take the models that have been built out on the peripheral and turn them into repeatable, reusable, composable applications. Around the peripheral, though, you have data scientists in each of the key business units who are working with the business stakeholders, identifying opportunities where and how they can apply data and analytics, building out analytics, testing them, make sure they work. And when they've got something that's hardened, they send that or they themselves go back with that to the hub and productize it. And the people of the hub who got done productizing, they go back out to the spokes and you have this fluid movement. I call it organizational improvisation. You've got your data science teams, your data engineers and, and your design thinkers moving back and forth where you're capturing all the best ideas at the peripheral of customer engagement oper operational execution. But when you've got gold and you found something, bring it back, productize it, so it can be reused across all the different parts of the organization. Is this something which is viable though for most organizations? Obviously your experience at Dell and what you see at, at Google and Amazon and, and Tesla and you know Netflix. I mean, these are digital first organizations. Um, and they'll throw the kitchen sink at developing these models. I mean, you know, OpenAI, one billion, two billion fundraised to go and, and put their models out there. Microsoft come in, spend another couple of billion. I mean, it's a it's a billionaire's playground. So you can actually pay for these technologies. You can pay for the people who've got the skills to do it, and you can actually generate something because you're effectively in a tech-led organization. But what about other organizations? I'm in manufacturing. I'm running groceries. I'm you know, uh, running some sort of services is, is peace. It feels like these things are out of reach to a certain extent. It's, I would argue that some of those organizations, especially the smaller ones have, a, have an unfair advantage because the challenge isn't the technology, it's the cultural alignment. So a company of any size can put in place a, a hub and spoke. Maybe, maybe you have a hub and one spoke. And as you grow the organization, you're putting data scientists in each of the business units as you grow the organization. But the idea that that only the big can play here is, is I think a lot of these organizations, the big ones, the Googles and Netflix, the Spotify, the ones you rattled off, they have a cultural mentality around data as an economic asset. They know data is their business. You know, they, they may produce products, Tesla produces products, Apple has products, but those apples, those products are infused with intelligence. The challenge a lot of other organizations have who don't start, as you said, digitally first, are how do I think about leveraging data and analytics to take the products and services I provide and make them more intelligent? How do I create this idea that not only can I make them more intelligent, but I can create a feedback loop. So as users are using my product, the, the feedback coming back and the products continuously learning and adapting. It's a, it's a mindset shift and how you think about where and how your organization creates value. You, you know, and if, if you look at the transition over the last 40 or 50 years of the most valuable companies in the world, there's been a transition from companies who are purveyors of products to companies who are purveyors of knowledge. And I think whether you're a grocery chain, a manufacturer, healthcare, theme park, whatever you, your, your primary business is, you need to think about how can I leverage data and analytics to become more intelligent to identify new sources of customer product, service, and operational value that's buried inside my data and then manifest that to my particular audiences and stakeholders to, to, to realize 
those sources of value creation. So let, let's start ticking off some of the mind shift changes that I think boards and senior leadership teams are, are going to have to go through. We've kind of covered the first one, um, which is this move from sort of double entry accounting based assessments of your tech data science stack to thinking it from an economics perspective. I think that is uh, crystal clear, and makes sense. I think the second one is there seems to be um, a lot of CEOs and boards who are in this trough of disillusionment. They've seen these technologies being talked about now for 10, 15, maybe even 20 years, and they've tried some of them. Um, and they haven't worked. Maybe they dabbled with a bit of robotic process automation or they've just moved to the cloud and they've got stung because they didn't um, correctly manage their microservices and it's actually hurt their bottom line. What's your take about the technological shifts that have happened over the last five to 10 years? We know that technology is only, the technology change is only going to accelerate. We know that. And if we're, constantly thinking about technology that's that's like the tail trying to wag the dog technology should only be an enabler we kind of started that in the very front of the conversation right earlier was is that when we think about technology as the end point then we've lost already right we think that you know that that the possession of data is our differentiation and that's not true at all it always boils down to how do I leverage these new technologies, Gen I being the greatest example right now, to create new sources of value? So there, as we talked about, there needs to be this, this cultural shift away from the technology to what are we as an organization? Who are we? Who are our stakeholders? How do we create value for those stakeholders? And then how does technology help us do that? There's also a little wrinkle in this, especially in the world of data and, and analytics, is that if we think about what analytics is about, what is, what is data science? Let me give you the Bill Schmarzo 16 word definition of data science. Data science is about identifying those variables and metrics that might be better predictors of performance. That's it. So if data science is about identifying those variables and metrics that might be better predictors of performance, who in the organization are best positioned to identify those variables and metrics? I'll tell you right now, not the data science team. I'll tell you number two, not your CEO, not the board, not your vice president, not your directors, the people in your organization who have the best insights into what your variables and metrics might be are the front lines. The front lines of customer engagement, front lines of operational execution, the front lines of partner development and channel development. These people know. And so the challenge organizations have is thinking that analytics kind of sits in a pocket over here when in reality, we need to empower everybody to become a citizen of data science so that everybody in the organization has the necessary AI and data literacy so that they can say, hey, this is the kind of problem here where I could apply data and analytics to help improve that. And then once you've found that and it works, you chance to, to replicate that, to build upon it, to create a culture of, of continuous learning and adapting. So to me, this, and not sure I answered your question directly, but this I this challenge here is we've got to stop thinking about technology as technology. We've got to start understanding technology as an enabler, but it's, it's an enabler of value creation. And the people in the organization who understand best where value creation occurs is at the front lines. So I agree with that, but the enablement comes from the fact that one argument is that technology has advanced significantly in the last five or 10 years. It's democratized, it's cheaper, it's accessible. Uh, certainly, when I look at it, this incredible things happen. We couldn't do the things you're talking about if it wasn't for cloud, if it wasn't for machine learning and artificial intelligence, it wasn't for chip manufacturers with Moore's law continuing to accelerate. And this just going absolutely crazy in the projections over the next couple of years. It wouldn't be possible without the Internet of Things, without 5G allowing us to transfer data so quickly. My sense is we've got this convergence of technologies, which is exploding. And I suppose my question, therefore, is are we at this tipping point now where if businesses have this false assumption that they've tried stuff before it didn't work and it's just too expensive, too complicated, that actually that's no longer relevant. Virtually every business should be in this space because it's cheap, it's democratized, it's accessible, you know, and people, if they put the right model in place, can really benefit substantially from better using data and analytics. But that, that's my view. I just wondered what yours was. Oh, I, I agree that the, the, the tech, this is why you have, uh, you know, an office of the CTO. This is why you have a hub organization, 
who's got a playground and is playing with these different technologies who evolve, right? The ML models are much much more powerful than we had, you know, five, 10, 20 years ago, right? But you need to have a core heart of the organization that's playing with these new technologies, but not just playing for playing sake alone. You know, it's it's how they need to understand as well, what is our company about? What do we do as a business? You know, how do we define success? And they're playing with these technologies with a view towards, you know, understanding how these technologies might help me help us as an organization better service our customers and our stakeholders and our communities. So yeah. I, you, you still want that centralized organization, but they're not there just to play with technology. They're there to figure yeah. out how do I, it's like giving somebody a brand new hammer. Well, I'm going to pound and pound and pound. Well, how does that hammer help me really build the Eiffel Tower? Right? How's help me do this? Well, that tower, that, that hammer's not going to do it, but this new hammer, that one's going to help me do it. Or I need this new screwdriver. So it always has to start by understanding what is our company about? And I think, by the way, not to get you know too far into the weeds here, I think organizations do a crappy job of pushing their vision down to the people in the organization so that everybody in the organization understands, has a direct line of sight from what they do to what's important to the organization. Right? We do a terrible job of taking the single most valuable asset in the organization, our people, and making sure that they understand and are aligned and under, under, not only understand what we're trying to accomplish and are aligned to that, but understand what their role is in trying to do that and give them, you know, give them guardrails to, to experiment and learn. This is why I'm a big fan of design thinking, not as something that's just done by a small number of people. I'd empower everybody in the organization with design thinking to ideate, to be, have curiosity, to try to create new things, to try to drive innovation that more times than not is gonna happen at the edges of the organization. But you need to have that central organization who says, by the way, these are the things we can do now with these new technologies. You know, blockchain allows me to do this peer-to-peer -peer stuff, right? Well, how do I leverage that? How do, I, how do I leverage the capabilities it provides to create new sources of value for my customers, my stakeholders, my communities, et cetera? Yeah, well, we'll have to have that blockchain uh, conversation at some point. No, don't. I don't want to go there. No, I'm not a blockchainer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to a couple, got a couple of questions here, Randy. I think uh, fits nicely with where we're going. Um, can you speak to the culture change or mind shift that you must occur in an organisation? Um, who has to drive this to get this uh, economic value? And yeah. how do you? What mindset and cultural changes do you need? Do you need a change in the mindset and the culture, or can a standard organization just pick up all this stuff and they'll be absolutely fine? No, no you you need an. It's this is where it gets. Um, it's a good question because it's, it is a cultural change. And it's about empowerment, and and, this is where, most, organizations, the vast majority of organizations, fail. They don't know how to empower their people because one of the fundamental aspects of empowerment is pushing responsibility and authority down in the organization. A lot of senior managers have scrapped to get to where they are to a power of position of power where they're making key decisions. The idea of letting somebody else in the organization make those decisions to give them the authority and the responsibility and the accountability to do that seems foreign to them. So I, it does require a huge cultural transformation of pushing that empowerment down. But when you do that, think about just the pure mathematics of people across the organization who are now empowered to understand what their customers are trying to do, what the operations are trying to accomplish, and are empowered to actually think about, well, data and analytics might help us be able to do this, might help us to add value here. That's the real game changer. It isn't from AI. It's from how people are using AI or other kind of capabilities to create new sources of value at the edges of the organization. So give us an example of an organization that does that well, and then I'm gonna ask a very nasty question. Okay, an organization does it well. I don't know. I think who's, there's, who's I think, I think about what about Tesla, for example, or, or Google, or I mean, these are the standard names that I would draw out of the hat and say that in general, they're doing quite well at this autonomous decision making, running um, lean, agile models within their, their workforce, allowing people to experiment and make mistakes, having a common vision. They've got a lot of the stuff that you're talking about there. Yeah, the companies that started digital first, 
have an unfair advantage because they created that culture right up front. Um, the companies that I have a lot of respect for, Tesla, the Apples of the world, the Amazons are companies that actually started with physical kind of products and then found a way to weave intelligence into it. I mean, Tesla certainly started the ground, but you know, they, they actually build a physical product. Apple builds physical products and they have, you know, Apple's a great story. They, you know, they had machine learning frameworks in their app iPhones years before anybody thought we would want to have machine learning frameworks in our iPhone, right? They, there was a, a sense inside that organization that first and foremost, they were all about this superior customer experience that, you know, Steve Jobs put that in there. Um, Tim Scott picked that up, that right, Tim, right? Tim Scott picked it up and has driven that through the organization. There is this, this operational excellence, consumer delight sort of impact. And it's, and they've done a great job of empowering everybody in the organization to think that way. The bigger opportunity is for organizations who, who grocery stores and hospitals and manufacturers and, and airlines, and you pick almost any other industry who has an existing base of value creation and hasn't tapped into how they can exploit that, how they can augment that with data and analytics. If you make, you know, CAT scans, for example, um, you know, those are very advanced capabilities. Well, what more could I be doing with all that data I have about each of my patients to make that, that CAT scan more effective, make the experience more reasonable? Think about all the ways that a CAT scan manufacturer, I'm not sure I picked a CAT scan manufacturer, but you know, all the ways that they could actually make their product much more valuable and relevant to all its stakeholders, not just its patients, but its operators, the doctors, the nurses. The, the, there's this huge untapped value creation potential for companies who already have products to take and start layering data and insights on top of those products to increase the gap between, you know, the, the accounting gap between tangible assets and intangible assets, right? Tangible assets are the physical product. All the intangible assets are all the insights are used to provide better experience. And I'm monetizing that in some way or another. Hmm. So the killer question is, and you don't have to answer it, maybe we'll come back to it later if you do find an answer, because I always struggle to find a, um, an answer for this, is which companies can we demonstrate and show people have actually made this uh, shift? Because the shift is hard. If I'm sitting there in a traditional organization, I'll just give you some, some time with the kind of thesis. Here. It's really difficult because someone comes along to me and says, I've got this great technology uh, and it's going to allow you to use the latest AI and you can sit it there. Let's just use a simple example. It's going to be a fantastic bot that's going to deal with your insurance customers. Um, and this is going to help you to make millions, billions, because you can close your call centers. I'm going to be keen, right? I'll be interested. And then they say, here's the consultancy firm that can help you implement it. I'm going to go, great, I don't have the knowledge in my organization. And then they're going to go and outsource, or maybe I'll hire a couple of data scientists, and I'm off to the races. I'm now thinking I'm doing uh, data and analytics in the way that you're describing. Of course I'm not, because I haven't changed the culture. Now, someone comes along and says, before you do this, you're going to have to go and have autonomous teams. You're going to have to experiment and fail. You're going to have to uh, move away from data lakes and actually start pulling data from source. You're going to have to you know, allow people to go and start spinning up and, and closing down and spinning up and iterating their decision making and the analytics that they get out. You're going to have to A-B test with your customers in production live, which may cause some customers problems. Uh, but that's okay on a mass basis because as long as so so suddenly how do you go and sell this to these uh, CEOs and these boards that actually you've got to define the culture and the structure the operating model differently first before you can really benefit from the data analytics I think it's a hard sell basically oh yeah it's impossible it'll fail guarantee it'll fail you don't sell it that way you sell it step by step you go into your organization you find a friendly you find somebody in the organization who wants to do it differently. Some business unit, some product line, you find a friendly and you smother them with success. Right? You help them, you go through that process, you help that business unit start to make that transformation. You, you can't do big bang, right? Big bang is dead. It worked for ERP system, doesn't work for what we're doing here, right? So we basically pick a friendly and we make them successful, right? Whatever use case they've got, we help them show them how to, you know, how we can improve customer retention by 10%, how we can improve, right? We show them how to do that. And they, by the way, they've got more than one use case. As soon as you solve the first one, they start, well, what about using it for this? What about using it for that? The other thing that happens is once other people in the organization see that person is really having a lot of success, 
I want to do it next. Now you have a whole different kind of problem, which is how do you prioritize? How do you align? How do you gain consensus around where we're going to go next? And you slowly build out the cultural transformation. If somebody comes in the top and says, we're going to make this transformation change and tries to ripple it on down, the corporate white corpuscles are going to eat that alive. I mean, these these initiatives don't fail because of because of technology fails. They fail because of organizational passive aggressive behaviors. Passive aggressive behaviors kill this thing. So what do I do? Small. Find a friendly. Make them successful. Find another friendly. Make them successful. Slowly build out. Lead by example. And at some point in time, you hit that tipping point where it says, "I want to start doing that. I want to be like that. I'm seeing success." And your again, your challenges change, but you now have that that flywheel working. And now that's where you put in some of the centralized, um, you know, centralized hub data science team who's enabling these other organizations. This is where you start making that cultural transformation. But like anything, it's got to be step by step. But you do need leadership at the top who says, this is where I want to get. And we're going to make that friendly successful. And we're going to find the next one. Mm. Uh, this one, um, I don't know if you want this question or not. I think it's a very specific question from Khalid. But uh, how do you create value from data in upstream oil and gas industries? Do you want that one, or something? We'll yeah, come back no, to that's, you? that's a that's a great question. It's a great question because how do you create value for any organization? So here's what I found works really well. And if we have time, I can tell the story how this epiphany came to me when I, when I was the vice president of advertiser analytics at Yahoo. And what I have found is the best way to create value. If you're looking at upstream, for example, in your example, is understand the decisions those people upstream are trying to make and figure out what data and analytics I can help provide to them to help make better decisions. What I learned at my stay at Yahoo was the value creation process wasn't about data and it wasn't about asking better questions. It was about making better decisions better decision about who I target with what ads, how much I'm willing to pay for them, right? It was about decisions. And if you can focus your value creation activities on identifying those decisions, the, the beauty of decisions is first off, every stakeholder you ever talk to knows what decision they're trying to make. Number two, right? I can attribute value to decisions. If I can improve decisions, I can, I can deliver value. Number three, decisions are actionable. Unlike questions, decisions are actually actionable. And number four, there's actually a fifth one too. Number four, data science teams know how to optimize decisions. If you can give them decisions, they can really go. There's a fifth one. I can drive organizational collaboration between my business team and my data science team around optimizing decisions. That's the linkage point between there. So your question was a good one because it says if you take the time Using design thinking techniques, journey maps, persona, all these other kind of tools and techniques we have, and identify your upstream stakeholders, their journey, their decisions, their KPIs and metrics. Now you've got the foundation figuring out, okay, here's what I need to do, the data and analytics that I can provide to help drive value around those decisions. Love that question. That's a good one. How important is it for organizations to actually have a sense of mission or purpose before they embark on on using data to actually go and transform what they're doing. Wow, that's that's a given. I mean, any organization well, to <laughs> you say that? it's a given. You say it's a given, but every time I talk to a CEO, they're always continually chasing profit and wanting to be the biggest or the best. I'm not sure that's a mission in the sense of of where you're going. No, I think you're right. There's the um the leading organizations, um, American Heart Association, a company I worked with, right? very clear on what their mission was and very clear that everybody they hired understood that mission, right? If you understand the company's mission and now are starting to empower people with data and analytics, how to help achieve that mission, now you got that alignment, but it gets that you got to be able to articulate the mission. You got to make sure everybody understand, understands it has a direct line of sight from what they do on a day-to-day -day basis to help achieve and drive that mission. Maybe American Heart Association was a bad example because that's a, you know, that's a very motivated. But I, I can assure you that you know other organizations like Chipotle, Starbucks, and such. These aren't you know tech leaders. These are organizations that have very compelling, strong missions. You think it's critical? 
I think it's, I think you can't exist as an organization without a clear mission statement. Let me let me let me riff on that one quick point though here, Colin. John Smale, who was the uh, CEO at Procter and Gamble back when I was working with Procter and Gamble back in the '80s, used to always say, "You are what you measure, and you measure what you reward," which is his way of saying, as an organization, we are what we pay our people to do. So if you say that your mission is around helping people who are um, you know, lesser than us or homeless people, whatever it is, but you're not paying people based on that, then that's a bunch of BS because that's not your mission. Your mission is has to tie back to, the, to how, you are, you know, how you are compensating people. And I see this today, by the way, this is a huge challenge in the world of AI, where we, we poorly define the KPIs and metrics around which we measure our mission. And we don't think holistically. Like we say words like, well, we're very concerned about environmental and sustainability and diversity. Are you paying your executives based on those metrics? No. Well, then don't tell me you're concerned about it. If you're not paying them on those metrics, don't give me the BS line that's important to you. Because if it's important to you, you'll pay them on that. And if it's important to you, you'll make sure your AI models have those variables and metrics in them so you are delivering more responsible ethical outcomes. Off my soapbox. Sorry. All right. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Cole. Can I uh, jump in, Cole, just to reflect yeah, you... on something and then ask my own question of Bill? Go for it. Go for it. So I think in your first sort of five minutes, something really resonated with me. This term economic value and you know seeing data as an underlying asset like any other asset and actually turning it into values a very different you know perspective which i haven't really uh you know put two and two together as succinctly as you did but just to reflect on you know how that'll help certainly me going forward is as an incumbent as a big traditional business with lots of existing uh revenue streams on on existing products we, we often struggle with words like, how do we commercialize data? Or how do we monetize? And neither of those words actually fit what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is try and create economic value to your point. Take an existing asset, which is there, it's been there for many years, we get more data every day and, and, and create value. So that is a great sort of penny drop moment for me anyway. And, and then a question, Bill, and it sort of talks to the theme that we've been going down. So, you said it's, you know, digital natives have got an unfair culture advantage because they started with that ingrained in their blood when they set up their business. Very much a different story in traditional incumbents. Um, and, you know, assuming you get the penny drop around economic value, assuming you've got the air cover at the right level to um, experiment or start somewhere, how... What's a reasonable timeline? Obviously, then managing expectation is important. You know, when you've got existing revenue lines in a big business, there's expectation. Um, what's reasonable? Well, how long did it take the ones you referred to, Apple, Amazon, etc., once they did see the light, start something to actually seeing a meaningful impact behind it, given they were a big business to begin with? Let me give you a better example of hospitals a casino, a manufacturer, a theme park, the people who didn't start digital, the people who are trying to learn how to do that, the, as you said, the incumbents, you can start realizing value in nine to 12 months, but, but it takes two things that corporations don't like to do, prioritize and focus. I can't boil the ocean. This is my, my, my rant on find a friendly, find a part of the organization where you've got an executive who's hungry for change, who sees, who is that incumbent, who has existing products and customers. This is the advantage that the incumbents have. You already have existing products and customers. The digital first ones didn't have that. You start with that huge advantage and you see this opportunity to say, okay, I've got these existing products, existing customers, existing channels. How do I, start to ingrain intelligence, continuous learning and adapting into those products. And if you focus on that, you can do your first use case in nine to 12 months, easy. And then once you do your first one, the second one happens, you know, five, six months. And then it, it starts to accelerate because first off, you're reusing your data and your analytics. 
right? So you've de-risked, you accelerated the project. You started to build this cultural, wow, look at this thing. You've got this cultural thing happening where people are empowered. Nine to 12 months, by the way, I think nine to 12 months must be your goal. Anything more than 12 months, you know, the, 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 the mental vision attention span of a, of a corporation doesn't exist beyond much more than 12 months. So that's why I go through this prioritization process to find those use cases that I know have, have significant value, but I can deliver them in 12 months. Again, that's my cheat. I'm gonna find those and when I deliver that first one, it just starts, it, the dominoes all start to ripple. But again, I think the traditional companies have a huge advantage over the digital first because you already have something in place. It's just a matter of thing, saying, I've got all these new economic assets. How do I create value for them? Let me let me go one other. I didn't ask this question, but I'm going to go here anyway. I actually think medium and small size companies have even a bigger advantage over big companies because they can they can instill a cultural change faster. They can move more quickly. Nimble is better than big in this space. The economies of learning reward the nimble, not the big. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Bill. How do you think Sorry, it's going to change over the next four or five years? That's something that's uh, prescient on on my mind. I mean, I my senses were at the kind of the knee of a curve in a lot of these different technologies. And as we've kind of been discussing, humans and organizations change very slowly. I think there's a law for it. Is it Martuk's law or something where, you know, we're, we're going to kind of uh, maybe if we get into a crisis, we might actually do something. Meanwhile, technology is up here and digitally native startups and Y Combinator, you know, uh, backed initiatives suddenly come along. Five, ten people. Here's a problem. We're solving it using the latest tech. And then four years later, they're worth billions. And some of them actually stay worth worth billions. But I still get the sense that we're at the kind of nascent stages of technology. And what's going to be happening over the next four or five years is going to actually completely blow our minds, um, which means we really have to get onto this journey quite quickly if we want to have some chance of survival. That's so you're asking what, so I, think there's, I think there's a, there's a technology on that's here today that we've not fully comprehended the power of. It's not Gen AI. Gen AI, Gen AI is great, and I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a lot of people sending me hate mail, but Gen AI is like the next version of a knowledge management system, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't doesn't really know things, it doesn't have knowledge. All it does is it 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 finds correlations between words and presents those to you in a way that sounds human, but there's really no knowledge inside that. For me as a user, I use that to augment my decision making. I can ask it questions, I can explore things, it brings me back information, but I still have to think for myself, right? What I think is powerful is what I call the term autonomous analytics, what we see with autonomous vehicles. I think that's a real game changer where you're building cars, for example, these, these, these vehicles that operate in incredibly complex environments who can continuously learn and adapt with minimal human intervention. Vehicles, tractors, vacuum cleaners, et cetera. What happens when we, and, and reinforcement learning is kind of the, the underlying technology that we don't really give enough credit to, right? It's, it's, it's really powerful. What if we start applying that not just to other products, which we could, you know, compressors and refrigerators and whatever else you've got. But what if we started applying that concept to processes internally? our process for how we hire people, how we admit students. We, we have an environment that's continuously learning and adapting. It's learning from its false positive and false negatives. And it's using these learnings to help overcome confirmation bias. And we've built a robust enough AI utility function that it's really, it is operating for the benefit of humanity, delivering more meaningful, relevant, responsible, ethical outcomes. To me, that's the real aha for what's happening with AI is this fact that we can use reinforcement learning and whatever is going to come next along that reinforcement space to really drive these autonomous processes, use cases, devices that continuously learn and adapt with minimal human intervention. To me, that's that's the cool. And I, when I think of, when I look at Tesla, for all that they've gotten been credit for for their EV work, I think it's their autonomous, fully self-driving module inside of it that to me is the that's the secret sauce. Are you worried about the impacts on on jobs and those sorts of things? I mean, 
I know that's not necessarily the, the scope of this all, but it's something I, I'm getting less worried about it call after call and, and you know, analysis after analysis, because I just keep seeing the technology at the moment as an enabler. And then as soon as you enable one company, everyone tries to catch up. Uh, let's use a simple example. We're going to use AI for marketing. Uh, that's wonderful. We're going to use data analytics for marketing. Everyone then says we're going to do the same. I had 20 people doing it before. I still need 20 people because now I can do so much more because I've got so much more productivity. Everyone's going to copycat and we still end up with 20 people. Maybe maybe um, I'm misreading what's actually happening here. I, you know, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I think your assessment, Colin, is, is, is spot on. Here's the thing that does worry me. I worry about creating a world of haves and have nots. The people who understand how to use AI and data and those who don't, who get left behind, which is really the reason why I wrote my last book. You know, the AI and data literacy empowering citizens of data science, plug, 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 right? Because I saw that I, I see this fear. I, I fear that we are, that there is a small priesthood of people who are going to prosper from data and analytics when we know that if we can raise the, the, the tide for everyone by making sure everybody understands where and how they can use data and analytics from both a professional career perspective and a personal development perspective. So to me, it's less about jobs and it's more about the quality of the jobs if we haven't properly empowered, educated and informed people about where and how they can use data and analytics to advance themselves. All right, let's uh, wrap up unless there's more uh, questions going through. I'm going to try my best to summarize some of the, the points or the ones that have stood out for me. So perhaps all the attendees do give us the, uh, the posts in the comments of the thing I'm missing. So number one, using data, data science analytics is something that all businesses should be running with. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. It's, it's really difficult to imagine one that isn't going to be benefiting um, from these technologies and the opportunities that we've got. Number two, small, medium businesses potentially have an advantage because they can make those cultural shifts quicker and faster. I think legacy incumbents have got real problems there because their systemic nature makes them like big tankers. It's hard for them to actually move. Number three, start small. Start on willing partners, on business-driven initiatives that you think that you can get actually up and running um, with the support and then just be aware of the fact you're going to be iterating and iterating. If that takes 12 months, the next one will take six, the next will take three, you get the flywheel, you're going to start to, to benefit from it. Number four, look for economic value. Stop talking about data as if it's a cost or an expense to be minimized. Um, what am I missing there? What would you like to add on to that, Bill? Those really stood out for me. I said perhaps one of the five, I'll just add that in as well, is, is the cultural shift you have to go on as an organization. I mean, we didn't really get into the detail, but these purposeful organizations are typically outperforming. But that just is the first step in allowing you to be more uh, courageous, more curious, to go and have uh, flatter structures, to allow people and empower people to take more decisions and so on and, and so on. What am I missing? Uh, you, I think you hit them really well. You, the last one in particular was a nice one because I think um, one of my favorite lines I use when I run these workshops is that all ideas are worthy of consideration. What I mean by that is I want to unleash the natural curiosity and it's embedded in each and every one of us. And if I can treat all ideas as worthy of consideration, which by the way, does not mean all ideas are good, but it means if somebody has an idea, I want to capture it. I want to consider it. I want to throw it out there because what happens is that somebody says, well, that idea, but what if we did this? And what if we did this, right? You start innovation and creativity is contagious. When you start having it, especially in a room, which is why the, I think the pandemic was really devastating for us from a creativity perspective, because you get people in the same room with post-it notes. If you can't see my office here, but I got flip charts and post-it notes everywhere in here. Because when you bring people together and you start and you embrace this, all ideas are worthy of consideration. The ideas start flowing out. That's what we want to have happen. Because as an organization, as an organization, if you don't have enough might moments, you'll never have any breakthrough moments. Bill, I really want to thank you for your time. And uh, Jono, do you want to close us out? Yeah, again, thank you for your time, Bill. It's been such an insightful session. I see the comments are coming through to the same effect. I think your energy has been unbelievable um, and and I really have enjoyed the flow of the conversation. Um, thank you all again to the participants who 
who joined us, to, to Laura and, and the support team who put this all together. As always, Colin, great, great session and thank you. And just to remind everyone, we will be doing another one, certainly before the end of the year. We will be uh, providing the recording to everybody who participated. And as always, please engage with us, um, come through to us on LinkedIn or, um, or whichever channel you wish, and, and let's continue the conversations. Thank you very much for your time, all. Have a good evening. Thank you.